morning. Yeah, I imagine what you're thinking is uh, maybe I'm not sure that guy's supposed to be up there on the stage right now. It looks a little different. Um, or maybe, wow, that guy dresses with a lot of style and panache, right? Uh, I have to find out where he shops. Okay, well, let me, uh, th this is something I'm going to explain later. Okay. Oh, the clicker. <laughs> okay. Thank you, MC. <laughs> okay. So is it Macy's? No? Okay. Saks Fifth Avenue, Bloomingdale's, JCPenney. Uh, it's none of the above. I'll tell you where I got these very cool threads. Uh, the thrift store, and I'll admit I got a little help from my daughter. Okay, so in fact, our whole team is wearing thrifted threads. My backpack was made with recycled uh, truck tarps made by Freitag out of uh, Zurich. Um, so that, that's uh, where we are with the thrifted threads, and I'm curious about you. Um, I know you've all probably contributed to Goodwill over the years, but I'm just curious, has anybody in the audience, uh, and, and maybe you could put your hand up, thrifted clothes ever? Anybody? Yay! Okay, that's really cool. Uh, how about shared books? Most, okay, that's great. Uh, used sports equipment from friends or the store? Got all my hockey skates used when I was growing up, okay. Uh, how about uh, invested in a pre-owned musical instrument like a Stradivarius? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. No, that's cool, that is really neat to see all that happening out there. So thrifting is cool now. Uh, my sister's been doing it uh, her whole adult life. Um, our kids are doing it now, which is really interesting. You can ask your kids. Uh, but that said, there's a divide. So a lot of young people are trying to keep up with waves of fast fashion, you know, Shine and these other companies. And it's coming so quickly now, they're overlapping each other and creating these mountains of waste. In fact, McKinsey and Company tells us that in California alone in the last year, uh, they bought 510 to 530,000 tons of clothes and that at least 500,000 tons of those clothes will end up in landfills. So that said, there's a growing number who don't stuff their closets with the latest fashions. There's a, a fast growing businesses, local and international, reselling clothes. REI in the US is a, is a leader. Value Village, owned by Walmarts, has been doing it for years. My sister looks great in the Value Village outfits. Um, the, uh, and even Facebook Marketplace is busy with thrifting. So what's uh, that got to do with all of us here today? Uh, well, construction is a lot like the clothing industry. We're absolutely needed. Uh, and much as you actually may not be impressed with my outfit here today, nobody wants to see me without it, right? So it's needed. Uh, we consume a lot of resources to get the job done, and we produce mountains of waste. In fact, our whole economy has become overly reliant on linear, unsustainable production and consumption practices that deplete resources at rates that are increasing production costs, business risk, as you can see by the chart, uh, economic instability, and also that produce emissions and waste that cause environmental degradation. It turns out that construction is one of the largest global resource consumers and waste generators. Our industry is responsible for more than 50% of domestic materials consumption. Okay, but, you know, all those highways and power plants we built with those materials are driving a lot of wealth generation. Unfortunately, they've also been the source of 40% of the solid waste generated in North America. And it's, it's partly because we're, st we're stuck in this linear paradigm. We have a linear economy of take, make, waste. Uh, it's how we operate. But over time, we can change that, and we can shift to a circular economy. 
a circular economy uh, tries to decouple economic activity and wealth from consumption of finite raw resources to the extent possible. A circular economy aims to use materials more efficiently, longer and in closed loops, as part of a transformation to a more sustainable and competitive economy. So this means opportunities for businesses, but it also requires new business models, uh, core values and policies. But it's all, like these local stores that uh, resell common building materials. And like new corporate divisions, a company you're familiar with, formed to rebuild diesel engines that work as well as new engines but cost less. So when you think of the value proposition that we're talking about this morning, uh, think of the skilled jobs onshored, think of the reputation gain and burnished image, think of the raw resource consumption avoided, uh, think of the supply chain problems solved, you know, when the new heavy equipment wasn't available, uh, you found a rebuilt machine, solved the problem. Think of your Security and Exchanges Commission environmental and social governance report. And maybe think of attracting those kids who get their clothes at the thrift shop to our industry because it's cool. So thinking about all these possibilities, CII formed our team to, <laughs> to try to understand the opportunities and values of implementing circular economy principles in the capital projects industry to highlight changes required to business models to maximize the value of shifting to a circular economy paradigm and to develop tools to enable CII members to make that shift. So our team developed knowledge and tools for CII members so that you can pursue the greatest business opportunities, effective value propositions, and key business models for driving a circular economy in capital projects. Our research approach was simple, relatively simple. We dug into the literature and the resources available online. Uh, we conducted a global scan of over 80 companies conducting circular economy business ventures in the capital project sector. We conducted in-depth interviews with over a dozen people active in circular initiatives, mostly in CII member companies. And we found success stories within CII, CII companies that are already doing this. We're gonna highlight three of those today. We also produced a readiness guide and an implementation guide. And we'll leave you today with a vision for the future. So to begin to tell you about the details of that journey, I'd like to introduce my wonderful colleague and teammate, Sarah Drumming, uh, who's a senior manager at the Smithsonian. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Carl. Good morning, everyone. Now that Carl has given you a glimpse of what circular economy is and why it matters, I'd like to share with you some of the results of our research. The circular economy is based on three principles driven by design. The first is eliminate waste and pollution. We take raw material from the earth, we make products from them, and then we throw them away. That waste ends up in landfills, incinerators, and it's lost. We cannot continue to do that. We cannot continue with that system as our resources on our planet are finite. The second principle is circular products and materials. This principle is based on keeping materials in use either as a product or when it can no longer be used as that product, it's recycled or remanufactured as component of raw material. Doing this allows the waste materials to remain in use for a longer period of time as a new valuable resource and the essential value of those materials are retained. And the third principle is regenerate nature. That pr this principle enables us to adapt our processes to make them more similar to nature. 
Essentially, we move from a take, make, waste, linear economy to a circular economy. We support natural processes and leave more room for nature to thrive. So now, I'd like to show you how the product life cycle works. As you can see in this chart, the arrows represent the flow of material from one stage to another. The main idea here is to keep materials and products in the loop as much as possible by using circular economy principles and strategies, such as recycle, remanufacture, re repurpose, reuse, and share to the extent of the life cycle of a product. In the capital program life cycle, we envision a similar approach. However, as you can see, the strategies shown here are slightly different, and the goal is to give facilities a circular treatment. Practices such as renovation, refurbishment, and retrofit are examples of ways in which you can extend the life of a building. You begin with a design that enables products to serve their original intended function longer and more efficiently. We also perform the global scan to investigate what is the current state of circular economy adoption in the world. And here you can see visualization of that geographical distribution of the companies we looked at. Our main focus was North America. However, we found that there are many more companies in Europe that focused on or already had imp implemented circular strategies in their organization. By 2050, it is anticipated that the global population will reach a will increase to 9.7 billion people, and the overall material use will reach 90 billion tons. That's twice as much as what it was in 2015. We know that the construction industry plays a large part in, that, in this material consumption, with over 600 million tons of construction and demolition waste produced in the United States alone in 2018. Though construction materials have high potential to be recycled and reused, we found that only 40% are currently being recovered here in the United States. And that pattern of material consumption and waste generation are leading to the depletion of our natural resources and rising construction material costs. So implementing circular economy principle into the construction industry environment can help address those issues. Did I mention the financial gains? that can be made by companies in the transition from a linear to a circular economy. The World Economic Forum has estimated that, sh that by shifting to a circular model in the construction sector can result in over 100 billion US dollars a year in savings in just the United States due to improved productivity. So while the recognition of the circular economy in the construction industry is increasing, during our research, we also found that there's still some level of knowledge and awareness with regards to the circular economy among representatives in the industry that have yet to be investigated. One of the interesting insights that we had during our research was that the distribution of business models in our samples. In this graph, the circle sizes represents the number of companies that adopted a certain circular strategy. In other words, the bigger the circle, the more companies that were using that circular strategy. As you can see, waste as a resource, circular supply, and resource recoveries are the most popular strategies. We also tried to understand the reason behind the popularity of these strategies and why some of them were not used more widely. It turns out that there is a very interesting correlation between the simplicity and the level of adoption. Generally, the more complicated ones, both conceptually and logistically, tends to be less deployed by companies. Companies have different focuses based on their circular strategies. Recover, recycle, reduce, reuse are the main focuses that we looked into. The company business type and focus can help determine the most suitable circular business model for them to use. Example. Waste and material innovation companies focus on recycling and reuse and therefore implemented waste as resource as their circular business model. 
Despite the many available opportunities discovered during our research, we also noted that we were not seeing more companies implementing the circular economy within their organization, and we wanted to know why. Well, we discovered there are several key barriers. One of the most obvious is a lack of knowledge of implementation of circular strategies and business models among industry leaders. The logistics of the transition from a linear to a circular economy, it's still not understood very well by our industry. Another obvious barrier cited was funding source. You do need funding to support this implementation. There's funds out there that, as an industry, we're still not aware of. What about the funding in your areas? Think about that. And another important barrier cited was the uncertainties and risks involved in starting a new venture. Because it's still a new thing in our industry, there's not a lot of data to make prediction. We don't have good life cycle models, and it can be difficult to estimate market sizes. Yet, despite those recognized barriers, we learned that there were many other companies that had already implemented circular economy strategies in their organization, and there are success stories out there. I'd like to share three case studies with you now to illustrate how some of those circular economy strategies have been implemented. The first is my own organization, the Smithsonian Institution. In June 2015, the Smithsonian Institution completed the construction of its first and only building to receive a LEED Platinum certification the Charles Mathias Laboratory, which is located in this, at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Edgewater, Maryland. The LEAVE Platinum certification was achieved by incorporating numerous sustainable technologies and by using building methods designed to reduce energy consumption and maintenance costs. Technologies used uh, and installed in the Mathias Laboratory include a geothermal system, a non-potable water reclamation tower, skylights, and a solar PV array. The Mathias Laboratory emits 37 less CO2 than non-LEED certified laboratories. It's 42% more energy efficient than a non-LEED certified laboratory. 94% of the construction waste generated was recycled, and 70% of the construction materials were regionally sourced. The second case study in our research is a sustainably sourced zoo enclosure project built by PCL Construction of Houston, Texas. In this project, instead of tearing down the facility, PCL renovated a 1950 building into a living habitat. To create this environmentally conscious yet animal-safe habitat, PCL used salvaged lumber and the Forest Stewardship Council certified wood in the construction of the animal habitat. When PCL re realized that by using FSC certified wood extensively would be cost prohibited, they decided to reuse farmwork lumber from their other nearby projects. Reuse, that's an example of reuse. And to comply with lead waste diversion rate, creative solutions were used by PCL. To further reduce waste, PCL salvaged and reuse existing hydraulic rams, faucet, Door, hard, door hardware and ash siding that was demoed from the existing 1950 building. The ash siding was remanufactured and reused to construct fencing around a separate enclosure at the project location. Piping was also repurposed as decorative elements painted to look like bamboo. In this case study, PCL showed us that companies can reduce waste and reuse materials during the execution life cycle stage as well as recover materials for reintroduction to the project's life cycle. The third example is the assembly of an offshore oil rig. There are currently approximately 500 oil and gas rigs and over 3,000 offshore pipelines in need of decommissioning. The topside weighs typically in the tens of thousands of tons. An entire 20-ton topside of a rig can be removed either in a single lift operation using a specially designed series of cranes or via reverse install, which is a backward building process where you take off the larger modules with large floating cranes next to the platform. You then float those modules on a barge for recycling. 
This process allows the majority of the top side to be recycled. So those were just a few examples that our team identified during our research. We have several other success stories in our report, including infrastructure and heavy industrial examples, which you can find in our final report now. These three cases that I've just shared with you are of companies that have been engaged in many common circular practices, such as reuse, smart waste management, and reclamation of materials. Now you might be wondering, hey, we're doing those things. Maybe my company already has some level of circularity. You're probably right. So I ask you, can you relate to any of these stories? Now, I'd like to introduce you to my wonderful colleague and teammate, Nancy Kralik, who will walk you through the readiness guide and implementation process. Thank you, Jamil. Um, oh, good morning. So Carl gave you background on the circular economy by explaining the failure of a linear uh, economy system. He gave you lots of reasons to implement a circular economy system. And Sarah built on the value proposition by giving you some circular economy successes. There are three principles for us to consider with circular economy, and those principles play a part in capital projects and product life cycles. There are opportunities and barriers, but hopefully we've convinced you that there is value in exploring a circular economy. So what's next? The research team has generated two guides for use by our CII members, or anyone or any company that wants to incorporate circular thinking into its programs. We should have come up with a new name. So they're part of the final report, available for download. So thank you, CII, Michael Burns, and his team for getting it out there. It is available now. We recommend that you designate a champion to work through the guides and determine your company's specific next moves. The Circularity Readiness Guide introduces the concept of circular economy and provides a framework and resources for assessing whether your company is ready to implement circular economy practices. The second document, the Circularity Implementation Guide, walks you through the implementation of circular economy practices. The, circular, the readiness guide prepares you for the implementation guide. You can read the guides in order, but if you feel you've got a handle on circular economy principles, just skip to the implementation guide. We'll take you through both guides today and the supporting tools. There are many available tools, and we have curated several for your use. I'd like to note that all of the curated tools are free except for two. They are available on the internet. Even those that have a cost, it's not too expensive and you can use them in multiple steps. But remember, you'll have to account for labor cost in operating the tools. So the first guide has four steps. Our first step is your champion to question if your company knows what circular economy is and what are circular business models. The guide provides definitions with the Circular Economy Redesign Workshop Kit by Disrupt Design, and that's the supporting tool. The next step is for your champion to look at where your company stands with regards to, to where you are in your company and what your employees think about the concept. What is your company already doing in this space? Two tools the Circular Business Model Canvas and the Circular tra Transition Indicator will help address this step. The third step queries you about your company's motivations and drivers. Again, you can skip any of these steps if you already have that information, so you don't have to go one, two, three, four. The first tool that we saw, the Circular Economy Redesign Workshop Kit, provides the support. And the final step in the readiness guide asks if you and your champion know what opportunities and barriers exist in your company. Two of the tools that we saw earlier, the Circular Economy Redesign Workshop Kit and the Circularity Indicators Project will support you in accomplishing this final step of the readiness guide. So let's move to the implementation guide. 
We have five stages. Whether you arrived at this guide by way of the readiness guide or straight to this one, your first step is examination of your company's goals for implementing circular economy. What do you want to achieve internally and externally? We have two tools to assist you, the Circular Economy Redesign Workshop Kit and Business Model Canvas. You'll notice that the Circular Economy Redesign Workshop Kit is cited in both the readiness guide and the implementation guide, so it's a good one for you to invest. Step two looks at risks, challenges, and opportunities. It's important to have a circular economy champion. You may remember that the readiness guide, step four, talked about opportunities and barriers. This step takes that step further and builds on the go, no, go, go decision, whichever way you want to look at it, and evaluating change management and identify whether there's a viable value chain. The tools for this step are two new ones, circulator and sustainability return on investment. So our next step involves development of your business model, business strategy, or process change. So you can use one of these three tools to help you. We've looked at those before, so uh, you're getting the idea that if you get invested in, in a couple of the, the models you'll, or tools, you'll be able to keep using them. Now our fourth step is to implement your chosen business model strategy or process change. You can go to an incubator. For example, there's one at University of Texas at Austin. Develop a training plan. Start your value improvement process. There are two tools that are recommended for this step. One you saw before, the circularity indicator project, and a new one, one-click LCA. Our fifth and final step in the implementation guide is that you'll want to document lessons learned. You'll want to continually improve your process. And note that you are able, and we encourage you to iterate on any of these steps. We're here because we're industry leaders. We have the expertise and the economic power to make changes in the way that we view our processes without being pushed by government regulations. Circular economy is a different way of doing business that is not extra work. It's changing our work fundamentally by integrating and transforming our existing processes and supply chain. It's looking into supply chains, material sourcing, cost, efficiency, and profitability. Ultimately, you'll find that it extends the life of products and saves money while meeting your sustainability goals. There may be short-term and long-term opportunities, such as benefits related to green buildings, even though there could be possible risks and barriers to change. And by incorporating circular economy strategy into your overall business strategy, you're going to be in the forefront of industry. Plus, you're going to save resources and money, and you're going to create an environment where our kids and grandkids want to live. So here's your call to action. As an executive or project director in your company, give circular economy the priority it should have. Assign a champion to lead the initiative and support that champion with resources, tools, and schedule expectation. Download and use the readiness guide, available today. Make it available to your circular economy champion and the team. Read through it to determine if your company needs to use the guide or can skip to go directly to the implementation guide or count on your champion to read the document and report back to you with the recommended path. Consider the suggested tools and support their purpose and support your champion to have your IT group make the software available. Download and use the implementation guide and tools. Support your champion. As you know, implementing is a lot harder than planning, but planning is critical to a successful project or initiative. As with the readiness guide, help with obtaining the suggested tools. And finally, go to a thrift shop, like Carl mentioned. Make your kids proud.
As Abraham Lincoln said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our, com our country. So let's think and act anew. Thank you. We're open for questions. I would like to recognize we have two members of our team in the audience, Luis and Rod, and they're available for questions, too. <laughs> All right. All right, so um, the first question we have is, is it safe to re to use reused materials in construction as safety is a much bigger issue in capital projects than for textiles? Uh, sure, yeah, that's a good question. I'm gonna stand up if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. The, um, yeah there, there's a lot of work around regrading lumber and uh, qualifying steel uh, for, for reuse. So for structural purposes, it's, it's doable. You know, you, you need a lot of engineering input. For, um, uh, for other purposes, for example, for converting it into, you know, uh, furniture or for, uh, you know, non-structural purposes, as you, you saw in the PCL example, it's, it's much easier, of course. So it, it, it's a growing sector, reuse of, of steel and, and concrete and lumber. Uh, for sure, there's reuse of windows and doors and hardware and things like that, but that's not structural. So yeah, it's 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 certainly an area that there's got to be a lot more research done in. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what about the liability if reused materials don't perform as well as new materials do? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not a lawyer. Um, <laughs> but I understand everything can be negotiated in a contract. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that, yes, of course, there's, there's always a, a liability issue with anything we do, and you have to manage that liability. If it's a structural purpose, sometimes you, you double up, right? You, you use that um, confidence curve or uh, reliability curve, and you, and you get really conservative. Um, you get an engineer to really understand what's going on. You test the materials. There are ways of dealing with that uncertainty. Um, but yeah, there, uh, there's, as we get more and more used to it, there's going to be less and less concern. But for sure, I'd have something in my contract about that. Yeah. OK, if my EPC company wanted to get started in circular economy, what one business model would be a good good to start with, and then which would give me the best ROI? I can take that one. My suggestion is the, the disruption model that I, uh, tool that I uh, described in the first um, readiness guide, which can be used throughout. Um, that'll give you the most benefit because you'll have a person or people experienced in that particular tool. Business model. Uh, as Sarah said, there were some very popular ones, reuse and recycle um, being the, the, of the top three. Um, recycle is, is what we do quite often out on the construction site. Uh, but there are things we can do besides recycle of not even generating that waste, um, which is something you go into the, the business models as well. Can a company bite off just one area and still call it circular economy? For example, the reuse of water. Uh, yes. In fact, during our research, we found that there were several companies that were using uh, one strategy, not the full uh, scope of a circular economy. So yes, you can bite off one part, multiple parts, but we encourage you to look at the entire circular economy strategy um, it's, it's, I think it's a necessary move to, to save our natural resources. Will my company price itself out of competition if I include it within my proposals? Oh, I'll take that one. Sure. 
contract, <laughs> as, uh, as uh, Carl mentioned. Um, but we're convinced, and we have seen many examples where it's not going to affect the price. If you do it as an add-on, yes, it will affect the price. But if you put it into your strategy, then it's uh, an integral part of that strategy and should not put you out of the job market. However, it depends on what the request for proposal says. Um, but think differently. That's what we're asking for you to think in a, a different approach to transform rather than just making an add-on to your, your project. Mm -hmm. oh, that was great, and I was just gonna add an example. Yeah. Um, there's a, a company in my region, a family that's been involved in demolition for, and construction for over 100 years. Uh, and they have a, a demolition company that they changed the name to Rethink Deconstruction. And they're winning a lot of jobs, actually, so they're winning work because they go into the project first and they see what they can recover uh, from the building or from the site and what they can uh, get a good price for on the reuse market, but also on the recycle market. So they're really thinking really more intelligently than just, uh, you know, destructively demolishing everything and paying landfill fees. Um, and they're, they're winning jobs because of that strategy. So, and then they have their little retail stores for materials reuse. They have their, their little uh, workshop, or not a little workshop, it's actually a pretty big shop for replaning lumber and stuff. So they, they are turning it into a, a, a growing business strategy. And, and I'd like to add also, at the Smithsonian Institution, for our capital projects, um, we have a division on just sustainable materials, recycling, uh, recovery material, reuse. We include it in every specification for our large capital projects, but also for our small projects where we may just be replacing a wall mm -hmm. or changing our flooring. So we, make, we made it a, a, a requirement, just like what any other requirements uh, lead as well. So you make it a part of your program and contractors, um, they'll buy into it. And if one company does it well, then all the other companies will, they'll see that and they'll want to do well as, also. So we have a, one more is, can a company start individually with circular economy or do we need partners that use the materials? Hmm. I'll start. Uh, if you have a partner, that's great, but don't let it hold you up. Uh, just get started. Uh, do something small. Think about it as a, a part of your integral strategy, but there are, there are partners out there who can really add value to your circular economy uh, program. And you'll find some of the bigger companies, uh, they do have partners in their supply chain. So I encourage you to look in your supply chain. You're looking into your supply chain anyways for efficiencies, uh, profitability, um, getting your materials to, to site on time. So look at them as, as potential partners uh, don't feel you have to do this big program and you have to get all these partners. Uh, get started, think about where you want to focus, and then you can look at, at your supply chain partners to start. Okay. Thanks, and I'll add something to that. Please. Yeah. Um, so that's, it's kind of an interesting question because you could start a business or a new division like one of the big equipment manufacturers did, you know, where you're rebuilding engines it becomes a really big business, and so you gotta find customers, but, but you really don't need a partner other than the sense that there's the customers. But there's also a lot of um, emerging uh, marketplaces, online marketplaces for reuse of construction materials. Uh, so, you know, it's a little boutique and a little bit more toward the building, uh, buildings and, and commercial buildings and residential buildings end right now. But those sorts of online marketplaces are becoming practical and when you, you know, so you don't really need to think of a partner, you need to think of a marketplace where you can uh, specify materials and, and find out if there's anything that fits your needs reasonably easily and, you know, is it proximate to where your job is or you can sell materials uh, and you can get really good, reliable information about the materials and, and maybe even bid on the prices and so on. 
So that, there's sort of these emerging tools as well. Okay, we have a couple more that came in. So um, did the team see any examples of using legacy 3D models for traceability, recovery, assessing suitability for new project uh, material requirements? For example, piping, structural steel, fittings, et cetera. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, um, we, we did. Um, there, there's, there were several techniques or, or methods that we discovered um, during our research that was used to identify materials, um, identify what materials to repurpose, remanufacture, as well as some guidance in terms of how to proceed. Mm -hmm. So, I, was there another part of that? No, no, that's it. <laughs> okay. I, I don't mind adding something. Like sure, that. Yeah. sure. They, um, so, uh, the 3D models thing, they, one of the things that we looked at was, you know, PDRI has been a huge success for CII over the years. And if you think about it, you could have PDRI for adaptive reuse or deep renovation projects. And, and we did actually try to work on a tool for that. Um, and a key part of that is getting a good as-built model. So, so there's a lot of, that's a technology thing, scan to BIM, which is getting pretty commercial now. Yeah, but also there's a lot of commercial technologies emerging for getting you know, behind walls and figuring out what are the services back there, what's their state, uh, what's their condition. So there's a lot of work going on in that area and it, it is really important for sure. Okay. Um, sorry, there's a lot of questions coming in. All right. <laughs> um, Three minutes. So, in general, um, of the examples that you guys reviewed, what was the estimated increase in cost to companies to align with a circular economy versus linear? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. We didn't actually look at that because we think of these as business opportunities, not a so, of course, you know, there might be an investment cost, but there should be a return on the investment or you're not going to do it. So, the, the, our premise from the very beginning was this has to be economically feasible and driven by economics or it's not going to happen. So, we, we were looking at success stories from a business perspective. And I guess we didn't look at it as an incremental cost to change, other, other than any change has upfront costs. Mm -hmm. Well, we did have examples with uh, the Smithsonian, okay. the, um, yeah. the Matthias Laboratory, oh, okay. yes. and the, yeah. the value that, that fit the Smithsonian's values. Absolutely. So, so minus any, any dollar amount. So we did see savings on our maintenance side, which is part of the reason why you implement these strategies. You, um, you can, over time, you do decrease your material costs. Um, at the same time, you're helping to save the planet. But... Uh, a lot of the technologies that we uh, used um, at our Matthias lab, it, it was in essence to minimize our maintenance costs. And we, we did see a savings. Uh, what that savings is, I don't know, uh, so I can't share. Um, but again, that's the, that's the part of the reason why this circular, adopting circular economy strategies is so important. Um, you, we, you minimize your, your footprint, your carbon footprint on the planet and help preserve the planet and, and the natural resources so that we can use it for an even longer period of time, make it last. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Um, did the team analyze any potential economic benefits or metrics that are included into your report that um, are recommended to track progress of implementing a circular economy? Yeah, that would be in, in some of the tools that they go into the uh, a register and then tracking. And it is important. Uh, we said it's important for documenting your lessons learned um, and using the tools. There's a lot of value in using organized tools that help you to capture costs, see how valuable they are, um, and then you can use them on a, the next project or the if, if you're doing some small project within your circular economy program. 
So the, the tools will be an, a very big help in that way. Great. All right, well, thank you very much.